Well, I'm pleased. I hope you all found the notebooks and the pens there. Uh, we also had ordered lanyards, and all of everything got lost in campus mail. So maybe we'll have the lanyards before you leave. Um, but I hope the lunch is good. I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Richard Kiley is Director of Engaged Learning and Research at Cornell University and very well known for what he does, so better? Yeah. Bango. That was awesome. Mark asked me earlier uh, what, you know, in the introduction I just said, just say it's Richard. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here. This is my mm -hmm. um, first uh, CLAC conference convening. Uh, that I've attended, and when I was walking up the stairs with uh, um, someone who I'd met in the hotel where we were staying, and we made our way here, uh, someone said, are you looking for CLAC? C and I said, is that how it's pronounced? Because I was worried that, you know, in the presentation I would continue to say CLAC and everybody would look at me. Strangely, she said, I've never heard it said that way, so CLAC. Um, so I'm very excited to be here, and, and thank you to Sarunda and to Mark and to Drake, um, you know, it's really a, a privilege to be here to talk to you today. Um, I'm going to try to do this, I hope, and I told Dawn way back in the back there, and her you know, will be awesome later on, um, to go like this or to go like this, but something that will indicate that I've talked too much. So uh, within, I really try very hard. It's like that balance of wanting to communicate some information and share knowledge, but also have an opportunity to have, I mean, you did invite me here, so I will say some things, but um, I would like to try to keep it to around 20-ish minutes. Um, and I have a lot of things that I want to talk about, and the conversations that I've heard so far, I think, relate to this. Uh, so uh, now, my, I've worn many hats at Cornell. I did my doctorate at Cornell. I grew up in Ithaca, New York. I was a townie. never thought I would go to Cornell. So my biography uh, is kind of interesting, uh, particularly even around community engagement. Uh, and now, and I've worn many hats in this initiative that we now call the Office of Engagement Initiatives and Engage Cornell, which is sort of an ethos that builds off our land grant tradition, uh, sort of the current or contemporary iteration of the land grant tradition. Um, and so the title for today's presentation is Engaging Cultures and Languages, Crazy Idea, Through uh, Global Service Learning, and I'll just use that acronym, GSL, a uh, transformative approach to global citizenship. And I thought that was sort of, uh, um, it lined well with the theme of the conference around developing global citizens. And I want to unpack that a little bit, and I've done some research that does unpack that, and fleshes out the meaning of what we might call global citizenship and different types of global citizenship. So, um, so I guess we'll just begin. Oh. All right, Mark. There we go. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, I often don't like to sit at a podium, but I will. I can project well, but if I do walk around and you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, so I just thought I'd pull this uh, quote out. Some of you might know Ross Lewin, uh, who edited this handbook of Practice and Research and Study Abroad, Higher Education, the Quest for Global Citizenship. It's a pretty thick um, text and it has a lot of chapters, so I highly encourage those of you that are interested in the term global citizenship and the meaning to run it and research uh, to check this out. But everyone seems to be in such a rush to create global citizens out of their students that we seem to have forgotten even the term that we were even trying to create. Perhaps we avoid definitions not because of our rush to action, but out of fear of what we may find. And I think, that's, and I think that fits a little bit maybe with the the Drake experience and some of the tensions around that, and also what we're grappling with within CLAC on how do you develop global citizenship through engaging cultures and languages or languages and cultures. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I thought that would be a nice point of departure. Um, so just some framing questions. Uh, what I uh, endeavor to do in any kind of conversation is I hope it's interactive and I hope, if anything, there's not enough time then at least there's some questions that you're still pondering. I don't think there are answers to these questions, complete answers. I think we collectively come up with how we want to approach these answers. So if you have a response to these questions, if you are provoked a little bit by, you know, what does it mean to be responsible? And I put in there critical global citizen because it's something that I've written about, critical global citizenship. 
and it takes on a particular meaning for me, and it comes out of a particular tradition. If we put the word critical uh, before uh, terms that we use. And then, uh, what is the role of culture and language in preparing and developing responsible and critical global citizens? And then, how does one learn responsible and critical global citizenship through global service learning? And that's something I've spent a lot of time with, uh, and so and it certainly engages language and culture uh, global service learning then. So just those questions, I hope that you'll think about those as I walk through this particular presentation, and then maybe we'll come back to it. We'll have a little bit better understanding for ourselves and as a group, what we mean by global citizenship. And I'll give you sort of what I think it is based on some research, but by no means is it the only meaning out there. Okay, so my first experience with global service learning, although I didn't call it that, we were just at the table and we were talking about when people hear the term service learning, it conjures up lots of images and assumptions. It's a whole field that's been developing for a long time. When I got involved in this, it was sort of like, I feel like I'm a signature child for CLAC because I have taught Spanish, I've taught English as a second language in the US and outside the US. Um, I've been a translator, lived in a lot of different countries for many years. Uh, and um, before I got involved in academia, to try to understand the theory around my experiences. And what's interesting is uh, the, my first experience with what's called service learning was uh, in 1993 at a community college uh, where I worked for six years teaching political science. Um, so I had taught languages prior to teaching political science. Actually, I was still teaching English for speakers of other languages. In those days, it was ESL. Uh, and, uh, and so I was approached by a nursing professor, another discipline, who didn't speak any Spanish. Uh, I think she spoke Norwegian. Um, and uh, she wanted to create a practicum for her nursing students. And she knew that I had spent a lot of time in Spanish-speaking countries. And she had a really strong connection in Nicaragua. So we ended up um, doing a, a visit to Puerto Cabezas, talking with community members and partnering with a particular organization, mostly a, a Creole English-speaking community. That particular area in Puerto Cabezas up in the north there has a, a mosquito uh, indigenous communities. Uh, it's along the Mosquito Coast. And then also, uh, they're mestizo, so people who speak Spanish. And it's very separate from the Pacific Coast and different uh, colonization processes. So it's a, it's a fascinating area in terms of language and culture. But it was a primarily a health-related program. I'm scared of blood. So, uh, but so I ended up teaching a course that was called, we created two new courses. I ended up teaching a course called the History, Politics, Culture, and Language of Nicaragua. <laughs> so thinking of culture and language. And we did that because we wanted to make sure people understood the historical relationship and the context of that area, the Atlantic coast, which actually I didn't know as much about in my training, which was around Latin and Central America, I got a master's in international relations, but I had studied more sort of the typical um, Central American focus on you know, support for Samosa, and, and we talked a lot about um, the Civil War and so on, but I didn't know a lot about the region of the Atlantic coast, so that was a a fascinating journey for me. That, that This program is now in its 24th year, that makes sense, 23rd year. Uh, still going taught by other faculty, um, vast networks that are involved in this particular health-related program. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to give you an idea that when I started this work, uh, I didn't know there was a service learning field. I didn't know, I didn't even really have a term for what we were doing. Other than we were doing health prevention education, we were working with a local hospital, a free clinic, a number of different organizations there. Um, you know, it was 1993, so this particular region was really in a difficult situation. Uh, unemployment rate was around 90%. I mean, it was really uh, a place where um, people were very resource limited. Um, and so uh, it was a, we had sort of a pre uh, set of seminars. Um, students would go down to this area for three weeks and work with a variety of local community members, and then you have sort of a, a post set of meetings to make sense of the experience. Um, and we would normally do about five to six health clinics, mostly in remote regions, working with uh, mosquito indigenous communities, but some in Puerto Cabezas and then one in Managua. Um, and uh, I know, as I said, we worked with a number of different organizations around health prevention and, and conducted some seminars and workshops with different um, professionals there, and we learned a heck of a lot. And actually over time, the community members, because I wasn't so fluent in the Atlantic coast, 
uh, co-taught this course with me, which made a lot of sense to me. Because uh, I met historians down there and I said, well, I think you're better at talking about the history of your own region than I am. Uh, and this is just, I'm just going to show you some pictures to the PowerPoint. I think we can, it's good to have pictures. So I'm just going to, what I'd like you to do, I'm not going to talk a lot about the pictures. Just kind of put yourself in the shoes of a student who isn't, you know, we're at a community college. There's no uh, support whatsoever in terms of a center or how to think about safety, uh, how to think about transportation, course credit, financial aid. We did everything, the marketing, the recruiting. Um, in fact, there was sort of a, uh, there was no study abroad programming, really. I mean, it was really very much faculty-led, and there was very little sort of practicum service learning types of courses. Um, and so, you know, we were kind of starting anew, helping the institution understand how you might do this type of work. So here we are. We fly down to Nicaragua, and we take a small, small, small puddle jumper to uh, Puerto Cabezas once we're in Managua, and we get weighed, which is a little bit stressful. So you get, I do want you to know that this is very, just very uh, dissonant for students. It's very disruptive. Plus, we leave a place in January, which is typically always left in a snowstorm, and then you're in the middle of like heat and humidity. Um, and then all of those bags we bring down had a lot of medical equipment and supplies and medicines. Uh, and then we landed on a, a dirt strip, um, and uh, this was after getting in the puddle jumper, and then immediately approached by kids selling things and community members. There's a little outhouse if you had to go to the bathroom. I always had to go to the bathroom afterwards. Um, I was very, I'm not good at flying, and so I had to pretend that you know, I was the leader, that I wasn't scared, and I was really scared all the time. And everybody's laughing as we're bumping along, and I'm sitting there like, it's, oh, it's great, we're gonna make it. And the pilot's going like this, because you can actually see the pilot doing this in the plane. Because they need to like, hold on to the whatever they do in the plane. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, and then this is sort of the transportation of the roads. This is when we go out and do some clinics out in the remote regions. And of course, the safety is wonderful. The seatbelts we have in the back of that pickup truck. Um, this is, uh, in that particular uh, ditch we were in, I was able to get out because the truck broke down. So that was fun. Um, and then uh, we worked in a lot of areas um, that don't have access to clean water. In fact, there's very little access to clean water. And as you can see, the latrines were built right by the ocean. And so a lot of the clinics that we did in neighborhoods, and this was a very um, disruptive sort of image you know, when you're walking around, you're seeing pigs and kids swimming in, in muck. And the muck contains a lot of toxic waste. So um, this is a market uh, that we go to. It's, a, it's an indigenous market. And you can see there's, there was no garbage pickup of any sort. So that pile would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over the week. And the smells and the sights and the sounds and everything. When students are in the indigenous market, we realized it was not a good idea to bring, the, bring them there the first day with the hanging meats and everything. Just the sights and sounds often we found in the first year or two. Of the, uh, I participated in running this program for about 10 years. But the first year or two, we realized that there was uh, different types of dissonance and different levels and intensities of dissonance. Uh, and that the high level of dissonance uh, would cause such disruption that students would want to go home the next day. Um, so that wasn't productive or fruitful. Um, and then just, you know, opportunities for reflection, uh, you know, with the Civil War and how much that informed how Nicaragua has evolved over time. Um, there's some remnants there. And you know, the ocean is such a big part of this community. Um, so it just, you know, sort of capturing students that we had, we're constantly reflecting, trying to process the experience. And then these deep connections we make with community members, mosquito community in the bottom there, and then uh, one of the pastors that we work with is Creole. Um, just uh, very powerful connections. We still work with these folks um, years, years later. And then connections with children and other community members, and you can see one of our students in some of the houses. Um, opportunities to dialogue uh, with community members down below, being facilitated by a community member. And then, you know, asking questions. Why is this so? Trying to make sense of the experience and what we're observing. Um, and then working in the clinics where there's three different languages spoken, uh, working with local doctors and nurses, trying to help support them. Uh, four generations of family members connecting with them. They're seeing you off when you leave. So you can tell that there's some very powerful connections that happen in a very short period of time, which struck me as very different than my own experience where I had 
prior to this, lived in Madrid for four years, um, gone to the university there, uh, had learned sort of street Spanish the first two years prior to getting more of an academic degree in Hispanic studies. Um, and so it was fascinating for me to, to experience something in three weeks that I had never experienced before in any of the countries that I'd lived in. And most of the countries that I had lived in, so it made me question my own assumptions about what happens when people go to another country. And what are the most important things, and what's the purpose, and how do we define success and quality? So I was questioning that myself as an educator, having again lived in Sweden for a year, in Madrid for four years, in Mexico for six months, and Athens, Greece, and just many countries over a 10 year period from the 80s to the 90s. Um, and then, you know, toward the end of the, of the stay, we've kind of come together some group dynamics. It's a group program, it's not an individual, so you're facilitating a group. Um, so I'm sure most of you have um, heard of the sort of Tuckman forming, storming, norming, performing, uh, the sort of group dynamics approach. It, it almost plays out every year that way, the forming, storming, norming, performing. And then what we often would talk about is adjourning and then mourning. Uh, and that actually was something we thought a lot about because a lot of these programs, you build this incredible experience and then you you leave and you go back to your disciplines or whatever you were doing in school or your professional life or your uh, normal life and then it's, it's a sense of mourning because you've accomplished so much. And that was something that played in the research I later did. So if you just reflect for a second, you saw those pictures, if I said what kinds of learning happen when people do these experiences, look at all that. Acquisition of knowledge and skills, so the typical KSADs, knowledge, skills, attitudes, behaviors. Right, so what we're trying to do, change in those. So what learning is, so it could be culture, language, content, and a discipline, so there's some added value there of going abroad. Uh, problem solving, problem finding, like there's no problem set, so right? It's not an existing problem, you have to kind of figure out what is the problem. That's a very different kind of learning than be given a problem and then solve it, right? So it's very complex. Like why are the wells so dirty? Or how come there isn't access to water? Or why don't people have health care? Or what, why don't they have access to education? There's no school here. So all those questions are coming. They're starting to find problems. They're hearing about problems. And there isn't just a formula to solve that problem. So it's a very different kind of learning. Identifying and evaluating the sources and solutions of complex real problems and issues. Develop critical thinking, conceptual research skills. The application piece. This probably looks like, um, some of you are probably familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, uh, which is, um, developed a long time ago and still very relevant today, but the application and the integration of what they learn, what happens when they come back, how do they apply it, social, emotional, moral, political, spiritual, personal, all of that was happening. In fact, when, when students would come back, they were deeply, deeply and profoundly impacted and they were asking me questions that I had no answer to as an educator. You know, I'm still thinking of the children there and I don't know what to do and I can't eat in the morning. You know, how do you respond to that as an educator? So it started really bothering me. I thought I was helping create a transformative experience, and yet when people came back, they were much, much more frustrated. They weren't enlightened and transformed and butterflies who had metamorphosed, and now they're having a more lucid understanding of the world. Um, it was, it, for me, it was a very frustrated, a lot of tension that students were experiencing and not knowing what to do next. So there's this intercultural competence, skills and leadership, teamwork, attitudes, values, and beliefs. Uh, personal growth, civically and socially responsible behavior. So all those are the types of learning that were happening. There's probably more that you're thinking about, hopefully, that were happening in, those, in, in, uh, in this experience, this journey. And then there was something that was interesting for me. Um, they were experiencing, and I'm using terminology here from, from the field of adult learning, but experiencing perspective transformation. So they were starting to rethink their assumptions and shift their worldview and thinking about how to take meaningful action. Uh, as a result of the experience. So is this something that gets at critical and responsible global citizenship? I put that in there, I added that last night when I go through this slide, typically if I do a presentation on what we learn. And um, it's that last piece that really plagued me because when students came back, they kept saying, I've been changed. This has been a life-changing experience. And it just really, I, I was befuddled because it was just three weeks. And it was really intense and I had changed. And so that there were so many things I was thinking about, like what's different about this kind of pedagogy, uh, the teaching and learning process? What's, di what's, my, what's the role of my institution in supporting a program like this? Is there a particular structure that we should use? So the institutional piece was bothering me. Is there a linguistic piece to this? Because we didn't require it. Should they be more informed about the language and culture? Three weeks enough. 
Um, so all of these questions, the pedagogical aspect, the institutional aspect, should we be conducting research? And should we, how should we be thinking about knowledge and how knowledge is generated and applied? All these questions were you know, filling my head and I didn't have answers to them. And I felt like I wasn't being a responsible educator because I didn't think I was qualified to do something like this. Even though I have, I think, a lot of experience living overseas. Uh, so I started looking at the libraries pre-Google, uh, the Coleman Library at Cornell, snuck in. Uh, I'm kidding, I didn't have to snuck in. Um, and, uh, and there wasn't a lot out there. And there, the term service learning, I hadn't found that. And so what I decided to do, uh, I got lucky. Um, I applied for a, a grant at Cornell to study my doctorate there. And specifically, the, my, my uh, research became problem-centric. All the problems with running a program like this, how do we actually run a high quality program that improves the pedagogy, thinks about how institutions can serve communities and have a public impact, either community development approaches, I've never studied community development or international development, is that something I should be thinking about, the community's role and our impact on community and very resource limited communities? So, um, so after I did my initial uh, proposal, my committee laughed and said, which of the four dissertations do you want to do? <laughs> Typical experience. Uh, and so uh, I chose the student learning piece. Um, and that was sort of like the best way to finish the dissertation, I think. Um, because that's how one of my committee members framed it. Richard, the best dissertation is the Dunn dissertation. <laughs> so, um, and so uh, I came across this theory that seemed to have a fairly strong explanatory framework for what was happening. It's, and some of you may have heard of this theory. It's called transformational learning theory. Uh, Jack Mesero at Columbia University, uh, Columbia University uh, coined the term in other conferences, many, many dissertations. This was in the 70s. He was looking at women who re-entered into edu educational contexts and what happened to their identity beyond thinking of their, their identity as I'm a mother to children and seeing lots of other women doing things that they didn't even think was imaginable and the disruption that that had on their understanding of identity and their ability to define their identity. And so he found there were a number of different learning processes that um, a pattern in how the women in his study um, transformed the way they thought about themselves in the world. Uh, and so um, this process, this particular theory is probably the most, um, uh, I'd say, prominent adult learning theory over the last three decades. And it seemed to make sense in describing how students experience this Nicaragua program. And so what I was interested in is what is the meaning of transformation? It just confused me. When someone says transformation, what does that mean? How do we unpack that? And then I looked at that over a six uh, to eight year period. Um, so that was kind of fascinating too, to see the longitudinal impact on the way in which people negotiated that transformation. If you evaluate students right after they come back, they're going to change the world. If you evaluate them four years later, a lot more frustrated. Six years later, oh my gosh, it's really hard to change the world. Somebody said earlier in a presentation, how do you use critical service learning, which aims at social change or restructuring power relations and lots of other things. That's a really hard thing to do. It takes a lifetime, in some cases centuries, right? If you think about some of the most difficult periods of the United States, um, you know, how do you abolish slavery in the Atlantic slave trade? How long does that take? So restructuring power relations is not an easy thing. Uh, so, and transformational learning gets at some of that. So I wanted to look at the outcomes and the program factors, the black box, what leads to transformation, and their particular programmatic dimensions. And then also I wanted to look at this strange thing called individual and social action. So is it about individual transformation? How does that trans translate into social transformation? And the theory actually sort of gets at that as well. And global service learning specifically targets that. The assumption is that you're changing students, they're becoming responsible global citizens, and there's an assumption that they're impacting the world, that something in the world will change as a result of their being, having a better understanding of what it means to be a responsible global citizen. And so there are very few theories that actually get that nexus. And so I was trying to look at that as well. So here's just a quick, and, uh, quick version. Uh, if you're interested, I've written a couple articles about this. What I found is there were, so in terms of uh, global citizenship, I found that there were six patterns or six outcomes. I call them transforming forms because they're still developing. There's this notion that you've transformed, but actually, if you're critically reflecting on your assumptions as an, an ongoing basis, you should be continually reflecting on the intellectual or epistemological development or how knowledge works, 
Uh, you should be thinking about moral and ethical dilemmas. You shouldn't just be, yep, I have a fixed understanding of that. Transformational theory uh, requires that you're constantly critically examining your assumptions and hopefully in dialogue with others, with yourself and others. So there, I found there's an intellectual, moral, political, cultural, personal, spiritual dimension. And not all students shifted in the, each of these dimensions. Uh, and the ones that shifted in all of them were really struggling when, when they came back from this particular program. And then the processes uh, uh, are contextual border crossing, uh, dissonance, personalizing, connecting, processing, and then what I was calling emerging global consciousness. Uh, and sort of this notion of envisioning transforming forms, which are those six dimensions, and then this thing I was calling chameleon complex. So every intercultural theory from Adler on, contemporarily, assumes integration as its top sort of developmental stage, right? If you're familiar with intercultural learning theory. What I found, actually, was sort of this disintegration. And, and one student, I think I have it, so I can get to it. Described it. every in my doctoral study, I asked every student the last question in my interviews: uh, What metaphor would you use to describe your experience? And then we unpacked it, which is a fabulous methodology. And she said, "I was a fish out of water, and then I grew feet and walked back in." <laughs> and she was on her first uh, service learning experience, and she wrote so many reflection papers for me because she was struggling so much with transforming the way she saw herself and the world, and then acting within it when everyone around her hadn't transformed, including her family, her church, her coworkers. They thought she was crazy. And so she was navigating that tension. And so although that she had a much more sophisticated <clears throat> understanding of the world, she had sort of transformed the way that she had seen the world in those six dimensions and trying to act on that, people around her were constantly challenging her. And she had a very difficult time showing her true colors, hence the chameleon complex. And so almost all of the students that I interviewed over this period would say the same thing. I'm trying to navigate the world that existed before I left, that's still there, and now it's the same world that I've changed. And so that's sort of this complex. It's not integration, it's disintegration. It's challenging the status quo. It's challenging norms and, and um, dominant norms and expectations that they find oppressive. Uh, and so, that was very difficult, um, and I'll just sort of give you a sense of some of these forms and how they play out. So the intellectual sort of shift was understanding knowledge very differently, valuing local knowledge, and not seeing it as something that's housed in a textbook or a university. That was a huge shift to see the, the different ways of understanding the sources of knowledge and how knowledge is used so, and applied and generated. So if you ask a student at any university, how does your university understand knowledge? Just a, a sort of an epistemological question. Very few students take philosophy of science, right? Very few students think of their institution as knowledge generating and knowledge applying, right? Or the history behind how we think of knowledge. And that can be incredibly transformational to all of a sudden start thinking, oh, so knowledge just doesn't come from my professor or my textbook or the classroom? Huh. And actually, other people outside of the university have knowledge that might inform my understanding of a really complex problem. That actually is highly transformative. You mean I might have ownership over knowledge? Imagine a student coming out of a university thinking that they own knowledge and generate knowledge and apply knowledge. I mean, that's a fascinating concept. It seems a very true. Like, of course they would. But actually, I would test this theory out. Ask your students, and then ask them, how do you, what criteria do you use to evaluate quality knowledge? I mean, and ask your departments that. What criteria do we use to evaluate quality knowledge and to reflect on their assumptions around that? Is it to get students outside the classroom, inside the classrooms, a particular textbook, a tradition, a set of theories? So that was very powerful for students. And it's this notion of knowledge here. So, and I'll get to this toward the end of the presentation. The, the moral piece was, now they're starting to see themselves as beyond just US citizens, but building solidarity across borders. Um, and not necessarily just with Nicaraguans. Um, some, for some uh, of the students, it was about um, building solidarity with women. And they often mentioned in the interviews, creating a sisterhood, a deep connection with women in Nicaragua. Uh, the political um, is sort of moving toward global citizenship. Uh, the personal was significant tension around lifestyle and their habits and the way they were acting on a daily basis. Um, the cultural piece was not so much doing as the Romans do, but questioning what the Romans do and wanting to do something about that. 
Uh, and then the last one, which was really interesting, was very hard for students to say with words. Often they draw, draw or give a graphic or a visual on the spiritual dimension, but it was this sort of, they left thinking there's about the larger purpose in life and sort of their interconnectedness, a more holistic, maybe ecological understanding of who they are, but really grappling with that. Um, so those were just some of the, the sort of transforming forms. And then, um, you know, so now fast forward a couple of decades. And having done this work all over the world with lots of other faculty and lots of students and very complicated places, I've come to think of a model that's out there. And I think this is a really important approach to thinking about, someone mentioned how do we create social change or just even institutional change. And that is, there are traditions in this work around, you know, uh, so, so I, I put here sort of toward, toward creating critical uh, and responsible global citizen, citizens a transformative and integrative approach to global service learning. So there are robust ways of doing that and, and sort of weak or limited ways of doing that in, pedagogy, in the pedagogy, in the teaching and learning bucket lens. Uh, and so moving toward more robust teaching and learning models within the community engaged field will lead to more responsible and critical global citizens. Institution and policies and structures. So often, if you think of yourself as a faculty member or student, when you walk into an institution, some of you may have thought about this, do you walk into an new institution thinking, I'm gonna change it? Or do you walk into an institution trying to figure out how your department works and how you can get tenure? Right? But it may very well be that your institution, what I started finding is, wow, we're not problem-centric. We don't go out and draw from knowledge in a community to create our curriculum. Crazy thing. If we're going to do that, shouldn't we actually be shifting the way we think about curriculum? How does my department allocate resources to solve community problems? Is that even something on the radar? So there, there's a sort of institutional issue here as well. It might be changing the culture of the institution so that we can do this work better and so we can teach, do the teaching and learning better. What kind of support do I have as a faculty member and training to do this work? Uh, so knowledge generation and application, which I used to put research in that bucket, but I don't like that term. So for me, how do we think about knowledge? There's lots of ways to think about knowledge. Who conducts the knowledge? How do we collaborate with community members to create and generate knowledge? Is that important? Is that a different methodology? Are we taught how to do that? I mean, that's really complicated. And what part of the research design or that knowledge process do we include or work with community members on? What if the problem definition is very different than our problem definition, or the methods we want to use, or the way we write it or narrate it? So those are all questions that I think are important. And then the last piece, which is a neglected piece in the field, which is getting more playtime, is then how do we evaluate community impact? How do we include and collaborate with community members? Each one of these buckets has a tradition in the field of community-engaged learning. Very few people study all of them. In fact, most people focus just on the teaching and learning piece. But there are really good uh, models out there, institutional rubrics for how you institutionalize community-engaged work that would help promote uh, global citizenship, responsible global citizenship. There are all, there's all sorts of uh, research on community-based research, participatory action research, lots of different ways of, of including community members in the knowledge generation process and students as well. Um, and then there's lots of great asset approach, uh, approaches to community development models that are out there that have proven to be fairly successful. Uh, so each one of those buckets, I think, if we think about a robust approach to toward building more critical and responsible global citizens, we'll be thinking of these buckets, and there are probably others. These are just four that I'm kind of sort of, I've stepped back and reflected on doing this work for over 20 years, and seeing that in order to really do good work in community and have a public impact, we're gonna have to address each of those buckets and go toward a robust model of each one. So the last thing I wanted to mention was, over the last three or four years, I've been asked to do a lot of preparatory courses for students that are going out in the field. If you think about the theories that I just talked about, so dissonance, contextual border crossing, processing, which is a lot of people, I use the term processing, a lot of people use the term reflection or critical reflection, connecting, how do you connect with community partners? Um, and then this sort of notion of envisioning, which is right after students come back, typically they're jazzed up. But then they start tapping into these patterns and they realize, wow, this is really complicated work and it's really hard to change something that I find deeply unjust or oppressive. And so what I've done is I've taught one credit courses, three credit courses to help prepare students. And what I like to do, and somebody mentioned earlier, maybe you could raise your hand, you mentioned the privilege walk. Are you still here? 
one of the panelists that they do? Or has anybody heard of Peggy McIntosh's word, unpacking your white privilege knapsack? So Don, some of you. So I do this. So what I try to do is I try to replicate what happens when we send students over there, what they were experiencing. So I try to create disruptions, right? I try to create dissonance. I want them to trigger this examination of their assumptions, which is really hard to do. It takes a lot of time. So I'll come up to a student at the beginning of the class and I'll say, tell me a little bit about your consciousness. And they give me a deer in the headlights look, <laughs> right? And I'll say, don't worry, I don't expect an answer to that, but you're conscious, right? And they kind of look at me, another deer in the headlights looks. And so what they start to realize that early on, this course is going to be something strange, probably is what they're thinking. <laughs> but also, it's really hard to understand <coughs> the presuppositions that underpin our assumptions, our values, and where they came from. They're usually uncritically accepted, right? And so that's often what happens when people study abroad and they start to see other people's assumptions that are very different than their own. But how do you kind of simulate that experience in a classroom? And I want them to critically reflect on their identity. So that's the next question I ask them. Tell me a little bit about your identity. And again, how many people have had an opportunity, even in this room, or including myself, to examine our identities, how we understand ourselves, and to have an opportunity to do that? Because when they do go to that country, that's going to come into play. And how do you, so check it out. So I'll do this exercise, I call it a culture pie. And I ask them just to draw a circle, and I'll say, I want you to tell me what your identity is. And I don't even frame it in terms of culture. I just tell them, just to find, it's totally open-ended, unstructured. And so some people will put 150 things, they'll categorize it, some people will put three. And I, you know, I'll say, you know, think of a pizza, you've got toppings, put whatever ingredients you want on that. And it's so fascinating what people put down for their identity. And we just start there, it's their identity. Right? They think their identity is. Nobody else can tell them what their identity is, although in some cases some people have an identity imposed on them, right? And we get to that. But we start off with just very bare bones, what's your identity? Because I know they're going to be reflecting on that when they go and they study in a cross-cultural context. And so we'll go through that, and all I want them to do is I'm drawing heavily from constructivism. I just want them to tell me what they, the meanings they attribute to their identity, right? And then we navigate that. Someone will say, I'm Christian. Okay, what's that mean to you? And then someone also say, oh, I put Christian too, but it means something different to me. And then someone will say, I'm a woman. And then what's that mean to you? Because I know there are going to be other women in other countries who are going to have very different perspectives on what it means to be a woman, right? And how that relates to whether or not they have certain rights or responsibilities, which gets that global citizenship. And it's fascinating to get there. But then when someone will say, um, I am a lesbian. And so uh, I'll ask, so I always, there's a safe space that we try to create before we do this. So someone indicates on their identity they're part of a marginalized group, something that's not part of the dominant norms. I tell people they don't have to talk about their identity if they don't want to, but if they do, and we get to something that's marginalized, I'll say, how does it feel? In this particular context, in this safe place called the university, to be that person, to be that part of your identity. And typically they say it's really frustrating, it's really challenging, I feel like I have to hide it on a daily basis. What happens in the room then? If it's a safe space and we've created an environment where they can have a conversation around identity, it's no longer about the meanings we attribute to our identity. It's about how our identity is understood by others in a dominant set of norms and it's not appreciated. And so then you can say, well, how do you navigate that? How do you negotiate that? And then you can point to people, this gets toward the global citizenship. Do you have a role in helping that person feel more comfortable on this campus given what their identity is? And so it pushes students a little bit to start thinking about their role as citizens and their responsibility to their other colleagues or classmates. And that's pretty safe. That's not even someone in another culture, right? Who speaks a different language, has a very different history. Uh, so how many people do you think put American on their identity pie? None. How many, so then I, so I, then I, you can take this so many different levels. You can bring power into play. You can do all sorts of things. So then I'll say to them the same question, how many people put American? Nobody does. I'll say, what do you think the community you're going to thinks you are? <laughs> right? American. I mean, that's how they're categorized. And what do you think that means? So if you go back to that first thing, contextual border crossing, what I want them to understand is they're going into another context and they have an historical relationship with that context, whether they like it or not. If I bring them to the Pacific coast of Nicaragua, they have an historical relationship. If they don't understand that we supported the Samosa family for lots of years, they're not going to understand why people don't like them that much. Just like when I lived in Spain. 
right? When people would sit at my table and say, ¿Por qué están metiendo sus narices en todos los países del mundo? Right? I'd be like, whoa! Sorry, I don't know George Bush. I know the first Gulf War is very problematic for you all as your partners in NATO and you didn't allow the planes to fly there to refuel. You probably remember that. Some others probably remember that. So I want them to understand that there's going to be perceptions of their identity that are going to be imposed on them and they're walking into a context. If we don't teach people from the get-go our historical relationship with that particular country, if I bring a Norwegian to Nicaragua, it's going to be very different. Right? Does that make sense? And so, but they're already starting to define their identity. So they're owning it a little bit more and they're understanding how identity is fluid and evolving. It's fascinating to me. So that's just one example, but we get at positionality. So I'll ask them to define themselves socioeconomic status, and some of them will stand below the poverty line. When they go to Nicaragua, how do you think they define their socioeconomic status? They're positioning themselves differently. Their identity is shifted. And so I want them to kind of start to understand this. The dissonance, the personalization, we don't have time to go into that, but what I found with dissonance, and this was a breakthrough, how many people have heard the term culture shock? Yeah, we use it all the time. What a monolithic thing, culture shock. Do we just throw everything into that bucket and assume it's all the same, right? Oh, you know, it's just like you have these problems when you go to another culture and you can't, the food's crazy. Well, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with it. Creating a term that's not unpacked. It has to, so this term was so fascinating to me. What I found was that there's a different kind of dissonance that was happening in Nicaragua. There are many different types of dissonance, and each one has a different kind of intensity, and it leads to a different kind of impact. So back in the day in study abroad, they would say, oh, you just do a pre-departure orientation, you inoculate people from culture shock, and they're set. It's like a vaccination, right? <laughs> what did people say? When I started interviewing them years later, I'm still thinking about that dissonant experience I had of the child eating garbage in the garbage can. And I, I'm still, I don't know what to do about that. So the dissonance didn't go away. You can't inoculate against that. Why? Because it's a structural problem. It's not their individual mind, no matter what they tell them. Right? It's much deeper. They, who do they go to to get the knowledge to solve that problem? It's still compelling. Right? It's still happening. So it's not an individual mind problem, it's a structural problem. That's what causes that tension, that chameleon complex. In order to solve that problem, they're going to have to talk to a lot of people, understand the history of the different approaches that have been done, their relationship to the problem, and there might not be a solution in the next couple of years. Right? So that's really problematic. And what if it has something to do with racism or sexism? Well, that's an easy one to solve. <laughs> no, it's going to take a long time. So I want, the, I want people to understand that there's a, it's a different kind of dissonance. There are different types of dissonance. So if you can't speak a language, what do you do? Right? So let's say you can't, I go to Nicaragua, and it's like, I couldn't really say I want an apple. I don't have my son in the market. Just, you can learn it. It's instrumental learning. You can solve that problem pretty quickly. Practice, 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 practice. But if you see somebody eating a out of a garbage can, you can't go to a textbook and learn a language for solving it. So there's a different kind of learning that also stems from different types of dissonance. And that's really important too. And some of it is just communicating with people. You have to talk to a lot of people to solve that problem. It's a practical problem. And some of it is structural. You have to transform literally historical, institutional structures and policies that have been developed over time that creates that particular injustice. And that takes a different kind of learning. Does everyone kind of understand that? So I think that's really important, and that was very powerful for me. So these other things are also incredibly powerful, and what I came to the kind of conclusion is, um, just for this presentation, I'm really struggling with this, is engaging language and cultures in deeply, deeply relational ways can be transformational. And I feel like language isn't just something that's learned instrumentally, it's the way we relate to people. You know, when we go out and understand people in a deeper and more profound way, it can be much more transformational. But that's really language, and I think this is the issue that a lot of what I've been hearing in my first clack is this sort of instrumentalist way of looking at language. That if we just put it in a text, and we teach people grammar, I used to call it the infinite intermediate stats, right? I took Spanish in 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and in college, and I got to Spanish, I had that same experience uh, the person that you cited was uh, the president who was walking up the stairs and the Russian person says, can I help you? And I don't know what he said, baka or something, I don't know. That's like, how 
know, you think in Russian, but I don't speak Russian. But it's the same thing. When I went to Spain, I mean, it's like, hey, macho, pero lo que sea es que vamos, es que no sé. They didn't say anything, and you're just listening to them, and like, oh, it's filler words, you know? And so learning the colloquialisms uh, and understanding where people are coming from. Like a Spanish person would say, ah, oh, Richard. Los, uh, and there's ways of calling, talking about Americans. Los Americanos, ah, uh, leche polvo. I'm like, leche polvo? Everyone kept saying leche polvo. Like, what the heck does that mean? Who speaks Spanish here? <laughs> so what does it mean? Uh, leche polvo, uh, milk that you can dissolve. In. Powdered milk. Powdered milk. Powdered milk. Powdered milk. So what's the significance of that? What's the meaning behind powdered milk in Spain? It's the Yankees got it. Well, Marshall Plan. Marshall. What did the Spaniards get from Marshall Plan? Leche polvo. That sets up a relationship with me. Right? Thanks a lot. You know, leche polvo. There's other, term, there's other terms too around that as well. But, you know, or la, la, um, la, la, la mala leche. You know, it's like understanding the historical, and you know, we do this again, but in the real, in real time, in a country, it's so fascinating to hear those things. And then it, I kind of understand, oh, now I understand what it says, Yankee go home, que se vaya. Yeah. There are so many people that remember leche polvo. I had no idea. I can't tell you the amount of people said leche polvo to me. <laughs> so anyway, and that's just one example. But it's that relationship. Every country I've ever gone to, particularly being an American, they have a relationship and they have certain terms that they use in Mosquito, it's Marique Crisi. Probably saying it bad. Crazy American. I said, how do you call Americans? It was in the back of a pickup truck. Marique Crisi. I'm like, what do you mean? I think it's Marique Crisi, which is crazy American. Uh, and I was like, great, that's wonderful. Nice to be sitting in the back of a pickup truck. I'm going to hold a little bit tighter to the, the back part. So uh, the last couple of things, uh, this is the last slide. So, so I said, engaging language and culture in deeply relational ways can be transformational. However, and this may be, hopefully, somewhat provocative. A critical global citizenship necessarily entails an ongoing struggle aimed at disrupting, <clears throat> decolonizing, and transforming historical, linguistic, structural, cultural, and institutional arrangements that cause harm. This is an ongoing principles negotiation that current conceptions of global citizenship learning do not address. Because in essence, you're setting students up to, be, to engage in the chameleon complex. I mean, I, I'm being very specific about that. And if you don't have a post course, or a curriculum that's sequenced to help students grapple with that, then I think it is unethical. And a lot of what I do uh, is to try to help people think about resourcing something like that, pre, during, and post, to have a sequence curriculum just like you do with any curriculum. A uh, critical transformative approach to global citizenship carried out in global service learning programs means a focus on intellectual, political, moral, social, cultural, and personal, and spiritual learning outcomes. It's not about expanding, not just about expanding one's horizons, but also transforming the horizon itself. And I really do think about that a lot, is that there is a horizon out there, it could be invisible or visible. The more students engage in this kind of work, it becomes more visible and they realize it, it socializes them into a set of a ways of thinking that could actually be oppressive to themselves and to others. And so the only way you're gonna get out of that is to transform the horizon itself. I think it's great to expand people's horizons, but it may very well be, and I'm using horizon as a metaphor for the structures that are out there. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Can I go over? I didn't see Don, you probably. Are there any questions or comments? And just so you know, I'll leave this up. If you're interested in anything around global service learning, these are, for me, the top uh, places to go to get information. GlobalSL.org is a great resource. Yes? same way, um, nobody's immune from questioning their assumptions, right? right? And their identity. 
So I, I love it actually when there are more, there's greater diversity in the classroom. Um, and so it's, it, my favorite thing is when there's you know just tremendous diversity of people from other countries and languages because a lot of Americans don't know how challenging it is for them also in uh, in that particular context, just at the university itself, um, the challenges that they experience. So I think it's very powerful. I think one of the things that I struggle with, um, and this is where I sort of draw the line, is that there are certain sets of assumptions that are very foundational to um, the identity of, of anyone. And so um, using critical reflection to get people to critically examine assumptions that could be very foundational to who they are uh, can be very disruptive and, and could cause um, significant disruption in somebody's way of seeing the world. So you have to be, it's a, it's a type of methodology that it, you have to be very careful with, just like going overseas to a country that's gonna cause a lot of disruption. And so making sure that you have um, resources in place and a curriculum in place that allows students to learn how to critically reflect, I think that's incredibly important. I spend a lot of time on that Global SL website. Um, there's a, a piece that I wrote on critical reflection and its difference between critical reflection and critical thinking and other ways of thinking about critical um, that draws from, the criti from critical social theory. And uh, one thing that bothers me is when people say reflection or critical reflection, often they don't use a conceptual framework to measure the quality of that reflection that has a set of criteria. And so a lot of what I do with faculty um, is to work with them to better understand how that they facilitate reflection, particularly critical reflection, which again can get someone to rethink their assumptions that are very foundational to who they are, and so to be prepared for that. Um, and also help the student develop better skills in reflection. I don't know if that helps, but... Uh, I'm a Drake student, and I've been helping out here this morning and afternoon. Um, you did a great job. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I was able to sit in and listen to what you had to say. So I traveled to Guadalajara, Mexico for J-Term a couple years ago, and I was wondering what your experience has been in, deal in having students deal with that distance, because I experienced that when I came back, and there was such a quick turnaround to spring semester that I didn't know what to do. and then it kind of hit me in the summer, and then it's like, okay, well, I don't really know where to go with this. Yeah. And it still hasn't really wrapped up for me. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think I mentioned earlier, I do think it is inappropriate um, not to have some kind of space for you to reflect after you come back, whether it's recent. She does. She does. So. Yeah, yeah I do now. <laughs> <laughs> And you do hear it's wonderful, that resource is fantastic and available 24-7. Um, you know, I, I'll just share an anecdote. I was at an institution years ago and I was describing the chameleon complex and a group of students had presented their, uh, I was part of a, um, a provost gathering and they were thinking about using global service learning uh, using the Millennium Development Goals and, and hinging their global service learning, global education around those, being driven by those. And so I was just invited to be a speaker and I talked about the chameleon complex. And we were done, there were a bunch of faculty, there were a bunch of students who presented on their experience. And we were just about to go have lunch and a student got up and, and was very visibly um, frustrated. And she pounded her fist on the table and she said, I'm experiencing the chameleon complex, I don't know what to do, and I'm really frustrated, and it just stopped everyone, because I know when I talk about it, sometimes it comes across as abstract, but I can't tell you the amount of people who go through this, and um, it, it's not great solace, but part of, um, the, for me, the process is finding a, a like-minded community. So being able to continue the good work that you're doing with like-minded others can be very helpful. To have some mentorship, whether it's peer mentorship or from the other resources that you have, um, that are there, uh, but also I think courses to help channel that. But if you're doing a pre and a during and a post and you're getting well-trained in reflection, the hope is, or at least the assumption is, that you also, without that support, can also um, start to really try to examine what next for yourself. But if there aren't opportunities for you and there isn't a community of practice, and that can be very difficult and isolating. So I always recommend to create as many opportunities for students to continue to channel this sort of uh, way of thinking of wanting to engage in social change work or wanting to make a difference, a positive difference. 
So. Well, thank there. you. I, I think we should. Do you have one more question? You want to take one more question? Sure. Anything else? Oh, yes. What role do you see the religious communities potentially playing in helping students kind of do this readjustment to find like minded? Yeah. So the, that was. Um, that's pretty much the one area for me where I don't uh, push too heavy on in terms of foundational assumptions because faith is such a huge foundational part of someone's identity. So it's a great question. And that spiritual dimension was fascinating for me in the research because some students who were agnostic or who weren't Christian or hold some faith um, found themselves questioning faith or going to faith. So students that didn't think they had a faith wanted a faith. Um, and so, uh, each of the students on the range of the spiritual dimension were some students, like one student became sort of a, was really into, became interested in Sufism and started teaching yoga and, and doing all sorts of things to satisfy what was happening to her and um, find ways to grapple with what she had um, experienced. So I would say faith-based communities are very powerful in this regard. And so find, having someone who's there to listen, to provide feedback, um, to provide support, I think is really important. So pushing students toward a faith base, and that's what I did initially before I had done this research was, do you have a church? Is there a faith group that you're part of? Um, people that, are, that you trust, that are supportive no matter what, that don't judge. Uh, so I think that's really important to also, you know, that could be a part of the range of opportunities to continue thinking about how you wanna grapple with the experience and also continue to make a difference. So. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.